All right, so here's a little picture of a northern pika. It's one of my favorite little critters. I took this photograph near Whistler, British Columbia, and I put it up here just because he's um, one of the little guys that someone has uh, sequenced um, and um, with dovetail, and uh, he's um, kind of a mascot for climate change. So he's kind of my favorite little critter. Um, but, um, but good biology begins with a great genome. And to start with, I just want to summarize what proximity ligation is. This is the core technology for dovetail. So uh, we've been around for, uh, I guess, seven years now. And um, the core technology of all of our sort of methods is based on proximity ligation. And I just want to briefly define what proximity ligation is. So here we have a chromosome. Now, it's actually being unpacked here. Um, technically, this is a bit wrong because when we do um, proximity ligation, the chromosomes are fully packed in the nucleus. But nevertheless, it gives you an idea of what a chromosome looks like in three dimensions. And you can see that parts of the chromosome are very close together in three-dimensional space here. And there's parts of the chromosome that are far more distant in three-dimensional space. And you have to remember this is three dimensions, not linear distance. Um, and so what proximity ligation does is we basically fix the chromosome, chop it up with an enzyme, and then allow ligation to occur. And the closer two points are in three dimensional space, the more likely they will ligate than two points that are farther away. And so we get this distribution of proximity ligations from very close together, so we get tons of interactions close together, and fewer and fewer that get farther and farther apart until we get to telomere, uh, telomere to telomere connections. And this is how Hi-C works. Basically, this allows you to scaffold entire chromosomes. Okay, so I just wanna point that out. Um, just a very brief summary of the dovetail proximity ligation technologies and terms. Um, so we started in 2013 with um, what we call Chicago, which is essentially in vitro proximity ligation. So working with um, molecules instead of chromosomes. And we, um, the first genome we did uh, with Ed Green's lab, Ed, Ed invented this technology. Um, the first genome he did was the American alligator. Then uh, realizing that we really needed to work with intact chromosomes, we released the dovetail high C. Um, in 2015. Um, and by the way, the software that we use is called HiRISE. Um, and HiRISE is a constant you'll see throughout um, kind of our history. This is the software that we use to scaffold with the um, proximity ligation data. Uh, last year, we launched our newer scaffolding technology called OmniC, which I'm going to talk about in the, in the briefly here. And um, the first genome we did with OmniC was the narwhal. And now in 2020 and looking beyond, we're looking at phasing and um, deployed assembly. So the pipeline, the basic pipeline that we use is we build a draft assembly using deep pack biosequencing. Um, we scaffold it with OmniC. We do a full annotation, including RNA-seq to produce transcriptomic evidence. And um, you should be able to get a, a very high quality uh, publishable ready assembly from, from that workflow. There's lots of challenges, as I'm sure um, Anthony can attest to, when you're building um, a, a genome assembly of something that's never been sequenced before. And the four main challenges are on the left. And um, these though, you know, even though there are these challenges, in almost every case, we can overcome them. And we've built over 2,000 assemblies now, um, and quite a few of them are listed on our Tree of Life, which I've shown on the right. This is something you can access from our website. This is really cool because if you have a project you're interested in, you can immediately go and look at historically what our success has been with similar species. So if you were wanting to do a lizard, you can look on here. And, and see Anthony's lizards were successfully scaffolded, you know, and, and you can actually see the statistics and get more confidence that um, your genome will, will um, work effectively as well. Just very briefly, how does OmniC work? So it works similarly to Hi-C, except the only difference is that in the fragmentation step here, we're using an endonuclease instead of a restriction enzyme. 
And um, the, the benefit overall um, is that when you finish scaffolding and you put it through a high rise software, you will end up getting very high contiguity assembly. So here we see um, each square represents a chromosome. You'll get a very high um, um, contiguity assembly like with traditional high C. The advantage of Omni C is just that um, we're calling a lot more SNPs in that data set. And why is that important? So it's because it allows us to phase the genome. And so what I show here is the traditional single restriction enzyme high C. Um, high C using multiple restriction enzymes and then the omni C endonuclease based high C. The dotted line, this is sequence coverage of the genome. And ideally we wanna be um, at a nominal distribution like with shotgun data, which is the dotted line here. So this is your ideal, this is what you strive for. And you can see that with single restriction enzyme high C and multi-restriction enzyme high C, you get a lot of under coverage and a lot of over coverage as shown here in the uh, pileup of, of sequence reads. Um, with Omni-C, you get this, this curve that very closely represents um, a shotgun distribution resulting in capturing a lot more even coverage and then we're actually calling almost all the SNPs in the genome. And that is why um, we're able to phase with Omni-C data. So that's the key uh, benefit of Omni-C. Um, now um, I'd like to turn it over to, to Dr. Anthony Geneva, um, who is going to uh, give us a really nice presentation on his um, Annalise Lizard um, uh, assemblies that he did. This was, uh, I think, I can't remember how many assemblies you did, Anthony. I think it was like nine or something. It was a lot of different genomes. Um, it was probably at the time, the biggest project we ever did in terms of the number of assemblies that we, we did at one time. Uh, and this is, I'm sure, allowing um, Anthony to, to gain some really valuable insights in evolution. So Hi folks, thanks for coming. Um, I'm gonna talk about nine genomes that uh, we've been working on now for, for three years with Dovetail. Um, the majority of the talk is gonna be about the one that we sort of selected as our flagship to take all the way through the process. Um, but I do have some things to say about the other, the other eight uh, and some comparisons we can make given that we have you know, a set of nine close to related genomes. Um, just to give you some insight about uh, how the assembly process goes and what are the things that influence continuity and completeness of, of genomes. So, um, I'm at Drexel University now, and for the next two more two months, but starting in September, I will be. Uh, why is my head? There we go. I will be uh, at Rutgers University Camden, um, starting a new lab there. I'm recruiting students and postdocs, so uh, please get in touch if you're interested in in joining us. So I'm interested in, in understanding the, the origins of, of biological diversity. And, and adaptation and speciation are, are the engines you know, creating that either via adaptation giving rise to new um, forms or speciation giving rise to new species. These processes, adaptation and speciation, operate from the level of populations up to species radiation. And, and a coupling of adaptation and speciation leads to a process called adaptive radiation, which exemplifies these two processes and is responsible for you know, a huge amount of the diversity that we observe in nature. Uh, among those adaptive radiations that are out there, anoles may be the most iconic, certainly one that's been worked on a great deal. There's over 400 species of anoles uh, distributed from the West Indies to Central America, South America, and the Southern part of North America. They have two sort of key features um, that, uh, are shared among virtually all anoles. Those are dewlaps. That's this uh, extensible flap of skin uh, below the throat of uh, these animals. It's present in most males and some females, uh, some female species have extensible dewlaps. And then adhesive toe pads. And these are uh, superficially very, very similar to the toe pads that geckos have, but they evolved independently, um, but use the same interaction at the molecular level with surfaces in order to adhere to surfaces without um, any effort. So an animal can hang on a wall without actually expending any energy. They occupy a diverse um, array of, of habitats and uh, those 
adapting to those habitats has led to uh, some much of the diversity that we see in the group. So uh, in the greater Antilles, in uh, Cuba, Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico, uh, these specialized forms called ecomorphs have evolved and they are associated with particular habitats and the body shape and size of the animals that exist in those habitats are, are extremely convergent. Uh, the way that we define these ecomorphs in addition to the habitat they live in are their body size, characteristics of their toe pads, dimensions of their limbs, characteristics of their scales, and the way they behave. And as I said, these ecomorphs have arisen on each of the four greater Antillean islands largely independently, such that on each of these four islands, you have a radiation of lizards that, have, that occupy similar niches across islands, but have evolved to occupy those independently, such so that, for instance, say, uh, the uh, crown giant anole in Jamaica and the trunk ground anole in Jamaica are much more closely related to one another than the crown giant in Jamaica and the crown giant on Puerto Rico, uh, or the trunk ground anole on Jamaica is not that closely related to the trunk ground anoles on Hispaniola. These radiations happen largely in situ and are a striking example of convergent evolution. And they are convergent to the point where if you were to create a phylogeny based on their morphology, you would uh, infer that the members of the same ecomorph are each other's closest relatives, where in fact, for the most part, animals on the same island are more closely related to one another than those on other islands. Decades of work um, in fun using functional ecological approaches have shown that uh, these differences in traits associated with these habitats are, are in fact adaptive uh, differences. These aren't the results of just drift occurring randomly on each of these four separate islands. And that's important because we wanna understand the genetic basis of adaptation. How does adaptation proceed in nature and what are the genetics behind it? The fact that we have this replicated set of radiations on these four islands allows us to ask the question, do we see evidence of molecular convergence associated with the morphological convergence that we know has happened in these species? In addition to their morphology, there are other axes of convergent adaptation in anoles. One is adaptation to live in high altitudes. So as you can see on this map, there are a number of places within the range of anoles where they have occupy very, very high altitudes. That's this sort of white along the Andes, the Cordillera Central in Hispaniola, to a lesser degree, the Cordillera Central of Cuba, and then the Central Mexican Highlands, uh, as well as mountains in Central America, are, are, are very, very high elevations. And we know that independently, these uh, habitats have been invaded by anoles, separate species of anoles, separate clades of anoles even, um, and so there's the potential for examining the uh, genetics of that conversion adaptation to high altitude. Finally, we've shown recently a, a paper that we published earlier this year and in previous papers that anoles adapt uh, very strongly to extreme weather events. Hurricanes is the focus of the paper we published earlier this year. We showed that across the radiation, the frequency with which an area is hit by hurricane can help predict the size of the uh, uh, topads of the anoles that are resident there. Um, also, the polar vortex you all may remember from a few years ago was shown to have an extreme adaptive influence on uh, temperature tolerance of anoles in North America. So given that we have this sort of great set of biological scenarios to examine adaptation, we said we want to push you know, anoles into the sort of genomic era. Uh, I think many of you listening are, are probably on board with all the things we're going to say here, but the reasons we want to sequence in all genomes are um, to get at the evolutionary genomics of adaptation, you need either a reference genome from the species you're working with or a very closely related one. To really properly do genome scans or GWAS type analyses, you have the greatest power when you have long contiguous stretches of DNA such that you know the order of loci when you're doing your analysis. And if your goal is to identify the genes associated with a trait, you need to sequence the entire genome, not just little fragments of it, because you don't want to find linked variants. You want to find causative variants associated with the phenotype. And then finally, something that I published with uh, Tony Gamble a few years ago is that uh, chromosome evolutionary dynamics in anoles are really fascinating. There's been a large history of 
chromosomal fusions and fissions, including fissions and fusions of sex chromosomes in an old, and they provide a unique system to understand the evolutionary dynamics of chromosome evolution as sort of a separate replicate to tie on to the models for chromosome evolution, which are uh, in other clades in the tree of life. All right, this will be repetitive for some of you, but I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page. So how we actually do genome assembly in this sort of modern era. The gray bar is, represents the hypothetical genome. What we do is generate reads as a shotgun blast from across the, the genome and assemble those to create contiguous stretches of sequence. Um, those are called contigs. Contigs are then joined together via a, a method called scaffolding where reads are generated uh, across larger genomic distances, and we use those to tie together scaffolds in order, and, and the end goal would be to have as many scaffolds as there are chromosomes. We evaluate the quality of a genome assembly via a couple different metrics, and I just want to give a quick primer on two. Um, for contiguity, uh, we typically use a measure called N50. Assemblies are composed of lots of pieces. I said in the ideal case, you have one scaffold per chromosome, but that's not the case for virtually all genome assemblies that are out there. They're broken up for a variety of reasons. Um, contiguity stats tell us how broken up those are. So, so here's N50. This is your hypothetical genome. It's 400 KB in length, and it's composed of seven uh, scaffolds, ranging from 100 kilobases to 30 kilobases. N50, all it is, it's a simple metric. It's say, what's 50% of that total assembly length? In this case, it would be 200 KB. Now let's rank order our scaffolds by size and add scaffolds until you have sufficient scaffolds to accommodate 50% of the genome. The size of that smallest scaffold is your N50. So in this case, N50 is 60 would represent the uh, contiguity of this hypothetical genome assembly. The second thing we talk about with genome assembly is completeness. So what portion of the genes that we expect to be in that genome are actually present? There's this fantastic data set of universal single copy orthologs. And universal is a bit of a relative term. Universal uh, can describe all of life or it can describe individual clades in the tree of life. And there are sets of genes that have been identified that have been present in most or all genome assemblies for a given clade. For your new de novo genome that you've assembled, you can contrast the portion of those genes that are present full copy or full length and are represented as a single copy in the Fusco data set for the group that you work on. So I'm going to report a lot of Fusco scores in this data set. I'll talk about how, what portion of the genes in the Fusco data set for vertebrates was complete, what portion were uh, fragmented, and what portion were missing entirely from our assemblies. And that's what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about completeness. Okay, so first, a background of what's out there in terms of the null genomics. So green anole, anole's carolinensis, was the first reptile genome sequence. Um, it was done in the, using the previous generation of, published in 2011, most of the work was done in the 2000s, uh, uh, and it was using the last generation of technology. So they used plasmids, phosmids, and BACs, and Sanger sequence, all of those. Um, has done a tremendous cost. Many millions of dollars were spent to generate this genome, but it's fantastic. It's highly complete, highly contiguous, and very, very well annotated. More recently, Martalis published three additional Anolis genomes, um, quadrupling the number of genomes that we have available to us in the Anol world. These were done using uh, Illumina next-gen sequencing at varying levels of, of coverage. And compared to the green Anol, it's somewhat inexpensive, but we run into problems because there are components of the of Anol genomes that make them hard to assemble. Um, there uh, is a very complex repetitive element uh, landscape in anoles, and it's difficult to assemble uh, contigs across repetitive elements, and they are so large that often most scaffolding technologies are unable to span large stretches of repetitive elements in anoles, resulting in, in somewhat discontiguous assemblies. So here are our completeness and uh, contiguity stats for the existing genomes. You can see carolinensis, 151 megabases, that's, that's pretty darn good. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very, very complete. Um, the blue bar uh, in the lower plots is complete uh, genes from the Busco set. Lighter blue are fragmented genes from the Busco set and red genes are missing. You can see that for uh, Mark's genome, he had pretty good success with, with some of them. Already, this is a very good genome, um, very, you know, pretty 
darn complete for Illumina only sequencing uh, and uh, pretty good contiguous wise, contiguity wise, but not nearly uh, as contiguous as say the Kalanensis genome. So how do we improve an null assembly? How do we get back up to that sort of Kalanensis bar that has been set for us? Um, we have to use different approaches. We need to generate sequences that span large genomic sequences, dis distances to be able to get across these chunks of repetitive uh, DNA. The greater the distance between segments, the more capable we are of spanning a particular TE cluster. And until recently, things like make pair libraries could only span tens of kilobases, or you could go really expensive, do FOSMID, um, and, and span much larger tracks, but there wasn't a, a relatively uh, cost-effective way to get across these large stretches of genomic space until we started working with Dovetail. Mark described the technologies um, uh, at the introduction, and so I'm not going to go really in depth here. We use Chicago and High Seed to span uh, the low, large stretches of repetitive elements in our genome. Um, again, Mark, Mark mentioned they use proximity ligation to be able to uh, create uh, DNA fragments that span large stretches of genomic space. And we use high rise to assemble or scaffold across uh, those large spaces. So let's get into the genomes that we did. Our, our first path genome was uh, Anola segrii, the brown anole. Uh, there's a number of reasons we went with this species, uh, not least of which is the one that we were focusing on at the time in terms of our evolutionary genetics, uh, evolutionary ecology research in the lab. Uh, some background on the species, it has a, just a massive natural and invasive range. It, it, it occurs across the West Indies naturally and has been introduced into a much broader extent. It's been introduced into the Pacific, it's introduced into the Central Atlantic, and it was introduced into Jamaica, actually. Um, it's interesting if you were to look at this map, Jamaica is an introduction, whereas the uh, dispersal from Cuba to the Swan Islands was a natural one. It's a group of, or uh, it's a species that is incredibly phenotypically diverse. I mean, depending on the island that you collect animals from, adult males can range in body mass by an order of magnitude. Uh, that, that animal in the center with uh, a little bit of a crest is from Conception Island, and that's the population that we sequenced for our reference genome. Um, but animals from the top left, from Abaco, they are they are ten times smaller than. Uh, than the animals from conception. And it's not that they're older or younger, it's they are in fact just this different from one another of these two populations. They also differ tremendously in the color of their dewlap, that flap of skin I mentioned earlier. They use these to signal. There's some evidence that, that these dewlaps evolve in response to signaling environments and maximize their efficiency. They can put them away when they want and they can extend them when they want to signal. And so one of the questions we have is, is with what is the genetic basis of all of this variation in this group? Aside from the work we do, uh, Anolis carolinensis has become a, a really important model for a number of fields, including invasion biology, personality. It was recently shown that uh, the boldness of lizards is heritable and uh, is uh, subject to natural selection by predators in Anolis, in, in Sagrii specifically. It's been used for years in functional ecology and developmental biology work. Uh, there are numerous instances of rapid evolution in Anola Segrii, because of its invasive range, there's interesting, cool questions to ask about in urban evolution and ecology in Anola Segrii. I have done a lot of work on speciation in Anolas. Um, that variation that we see in the previous image uh, it may give rise to, to, you know, potentially new, putative new species. Um, and given that there's a lot of variation in the group, we can use those differences to test hypotheses about what drives the process of speciation. And finally, and very recently, we've got functional genomics working in uh, Anola Segrii, um, not be me specifically, but the community, uh, Doug Minkie's lab specifically, an incredible tool to use CRISPR in Anola and actually get at what is happening with uh, genetic variants in, in this group. So uh, I'll talk about that at the very end, but I just wanted to throw that out there. CRISPR in lizards, is new, unique, and it's only happening in the old state AI. So here was our initial pipeline. We generated uh, deep coverage Illumina paired end sequencing and assembled with Miraculous. That was then scaffolded with Chicago uh, and high rise sequencing, and, and that led to us generating our, our first assembly in old state AI 1.0. We started this project in 2017, and, and by the end of 2017, we had our first you know, 1.0 genome. What we discovered though, looking at that first assembly was that while uh, 
our genome had most of the genes we expected in it, and it had most of the exons in those genes, there were some issues with orientation of individual exons. And that's because our, our initial assembly was incredibly discontinuous, such that often an exon from a gene was on a different contig than the next exon, than the next on, exon, than the next exon. Chicago and high C scaffolding did a really good job of placing them in order, but there's not information about orientation there. And so often you would have uh, two exons in uh, one frame, or not, excuse me, not one frame, in one coding direction, one strand, and then the third exon would be in the opposite strand. And these are genes that are deeply conserved across vertebrates that are always in the same direction. It's very clear that that's not actually correct. And so we decided to add some technology to our sequencing. Luckily, we had flash frozen the genome animal and we had access to additional tissues. So we split Anola Sacrii back, uh, Sacrii 1.0 back into contig and rescaffold that that with PacBio moderate coverage, PacBio HiFi sequencing, and then ran it back through with the Chicago and high C data that we had collected in the first round to generate Anola Sacrii 2.0. This increased contiguity a little bit, but the main thing it did was it put things in, in the correct orientation. Um, what we ended up with is, I think, a really, really nice genome. So let's talk about what I mean by a really, really nice genome. Here are our steps along the way. The de novo assembly, as I said, was really discontiguous. It was on the lower end of the distribution for uh, anoles done with just short read technology. But Chicago really quickly uh, increased our N50 substantially, uh, high C even more so. At that point that we broke things up, we basically took any stretch of uh, 100 ends or more, uh, broke those into, re-broke those into contig and re-scaffolded using PacBio data. Going back through Chicago and, oops, excuse me, going back through Chicago and high C, we ended up with a, a final assembly with an N50 of, of 314 megabases. I mean, highly, highly, highly contiguous for an annul twice what, what we were able to get with Carolinensis for many millions of dollars. As you can see with the link density histogram, we are getting sort of chromosomes, pseudochromosomes. Our scaffolds represent pseudochromosomes. And that's been independently uh, verified by one of my colleagues who took a high resolution karyotype of an old sacrii, measured the actual size of the uh, chromosomes in those images, estimated the chromosome size based on the total genome size, uh, C value size. And what we find is that our scaffold, scaffold one, is, is almost exactly the size expected by the karyotype. Same with two, same with three, all the way out to six, they're getting chromosome scale scaffolds in that way. Uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but we had a very, very complete assembly as well. We had only 2% of the genes missing from uh, the vertebrate Busco data set. Uh, and the vast majority of genes were present in full length and in single copy. Just a little taste of, of some of the things that we can do with such a complete genome. We know in the history of anoles that there's been a complex history of fusions and fissions, including sex chromosomes. Um, just by comparing the anole carolinensis uh, assembly, which was anchored with fish. So we know anoles chromosome nine is anoles in the assembly is anoles chromosome nine uh, in, in nature. We can see that anoles sigrii scaffold six is composed of uh, nine anolus carolinensis scaffolds. I can't tell you right now for certain the directionality of this, if uh, it's been a history of fission in the carolinensis lineage or a history of fusion in the sagrii lineage, although I have my, my guess about which this is, but, but we're able to stitch together and show the, this process of uh, fusions and fissions um, in the history of anoles uh, simply by having incredibly complete contiguous uh, assemblies, you know, chromosome scale scaffolds. Uh, that's really all I want to say about Sagrii right now, because I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the additional genomes that we have. This is a highly trimmed down version of uh, the anole phylogeny, and the colors are coding the, the eight major clades that are present within the group. Um, this is only about 100 species on this tree, where in fact there are about 300. We're interested in being able to analyze any species in this clade, and, and while within these, or within anole, and within each of these clades, animals are relatively closely related to one another, species relatively closely related. You, you, you get some pretty deep divergences when you start to compare across clades. So if you had a single reference, say, uh, in Sigrii, you would be hard pressed to align uh, a full genome from the light blue clade on the left uh, to a Sigrii reference. And so 
we chose to do de novo assemblies for, for nine species, eight in addition to the uh, intentionally sampling across the anole radiation such that we have representatives from each of the major clays, and in some cases, multiple representatives from each of the major clays that we can use to align uh, subsequent work that we do. We resequence pretty much any and all species uh, in nature, we're able to align it to a relatively close, uh, closely related species. Our sampling was also biased to include uh, instances of those replicated ecomorphs that I mentioned at the very beginning. So we seeking three trunk round and old from three different islands. These things are distantly related to each other, but they're superficially very similar. We sequenced an additional two trunk crown and old plus carolinensis there at the bottom. Uh, and we sequenced two grass bush and old. Uh, from these single genomes, there's only so much we can do in terms of um, evaluating genomic convergence, but we have plans to do a whole lot more. And these reference genomes by themselves are an incredible resource. So how, how did they turn out? Just a reminder, here's Carolinensis, uh, pretty complete, not very much missing. Here are the three genomes uh, done by Illumina short read sequencing, uh, somewhat complete, a lot of variation of Pletophallus, not so great, Aratus, pretty darn good. Now on top are our nine genomes. Um, some of them can exceed the completeness of, of Carolinensis, which again was done at, at huge cost, and all of them are, are very well done and improve upon existing uh, assemblies that exist for the species that we redid, including Anolis pernatus and Anolis aratus. As a comparison for contiguity, so uh, the um, light blue bars are the species that we've done. Black bars are, are other reptiles. Uh, there's, there's the green anole uh, dead center. Now, uh, a preprint just came out last week, week before, um, reporting a scoloporous genome that's on the left-hand side of this distribution. It's not quite greater than Fernatus or Sagri, but it's also really, really good. And it's using similarly uh, a number of technologies. And I think this is going to be the way to go. We're going to have to use multiple sequencing platforms in order to get really complete reptile genomes because they're just difficult to sequence. Because we have nine genomes and we have a bunch of additional data about those genomes, we can start to ask questions about what influences assembly quality in, in a statistical framework, right? Um, uh, nine isn't a great sample size, but it's better than one. Because these are relatively closely related, also I can, to some degree, wipe out evolutionary history as a causative reason for uh, differences in assembly quality, and we can focus on what, how these genomes differ and get an answer of you know, what, what is actually driving completeness and contiguity. So let's start with contiguity. I ran a general linear model um, comparing a few possible explanatory variables, um, uh, asking which, if any of them, have an influence on N50 contiguity. So assembly length, there's no relationship. Sequencing coverage, and that's, I do that by uh, looking at either the paradigm sequencing, the Illumina sequencing we did, or the Chicago sequencing, or the high-rise sequencing, or all of the sequencing together combined, uh, no influence on contiguity. Heterozygosity, which I was sort of rooting for as a likely uh, correlate to N50 contiguity, and at least in this group, didn't show up as a significant relationship. And, and completeness. Completeness in terms of BUSCO completeness didn't predict N50 contiguity. Uh, so I don't really have a good guess right now as to what is the, the definitive thing that's driving N50 contiguity in an old. Uh, this is heter estimated heterozygosity. Um, these are from estimated from raw reads using jellyfish and genome scope. Uh, there, there seems to be a relationship here, but it's not significant. And I don't want to say too much more about it because it's not a significant relationship. But um, it's one hypothesis to follow up on, perhaps. Uh, completeness, on the other hand, we did actually find, uh, again, assembly length didn't have any relationship on Bosco completeness, nor did sequencing coverage. But heterozygosity strongly, significantly is correlated negatively with um, Bosco completeness. And N50 contiguity, as you would expect, because the other direction didn't have uh, any relationship, doesn't predict Bosco completeness. So here's, here's the plot of uh, the percent missing Bosco, vertebrate Buscos in our nine assemblies and estimated heterozygosity. As you can see, as heterozygosity goes up, our percent missing Buscos also goes up. So we have less complete genomes when heterozygosity is, is high. Um, and this is actually a pretty high R squared. I think it's about 75% R squared. There could be other factors that are driving this that, that are you know, positively misleading this relationship. One very obvious one would be 
um, repetitive element landscape. Uh, repeats can look like heterozygous sites and repeats are a nightmare for assembly as we all know and anoles have a lot of variation in their repeat complement. We're working now to really carefully characterize repeat comp content in each of our nine reference genomes um, and I look forward to being able to incorporate into this analysis some measure of, of repeat content and try to really get at like what is the thing driving uh, quality of these genome assemblies. So uh, how are we using these genomes? Um, we've recently got money to resequence hundreds of anole species using our uh, de novo assemblies as reference uh, to do resequences. Resequence these uh, species, align them to one of our nine reference genomes, and then perform a suite of evolutionary genetic analyses to try to test for the presence of genomic convergence underlying the different convergent phenotypes that I mentioned at, at, at the outset of the talk. And we can leverage the fact that our adaptive radiation in is replicated to test in a, in a statistical framework whether or not we see more convergence than expected uh, by just simple chance. We also hope to identify candidate genomic regions that are associated with these adaptive traits. And, and you know, until last year, that used to be the end of the story. Here's a, here's a cool candidate that we talk about. It has some interesting annotations in mouse or in human or in uh, zebrafish that may suggest the role of that gene in some adaptive phenotype in anoles, but we can now take things a step further thanks to a recent development um, coming from Mark, uh, or Doug Mankey's lab. But he's got CRISPR uh, working in anoles sacri. Uh, they published last year in Cell Reports their, their protocol. Uh, it involves uh, surgery, surgery on the lizards because uh, in order to inject into early stage embryos, you need to actually open up a female and inject into ova in her reproductive tract. Uh, the eggs laid, it's in somatogenesis. It's far too uh, developed to be able to do uh, CRISPR effectively. And so the major innovation was getting a uh, surgical technique that would work and allow these animals to recover, lay their eggs, and hatchlings uh, to survive. Here's the, the sort of stunning example that they've been able to generate. Here, sibling anoles one uh, with an inactivated tyrosinase, tyrosinase um, inactivated by CRISPR, uh, an albino compared to its uh, wild type sibling. So I said the goal before was we're gonna try to find candidate regions associated with traits. We can now test functionally what those traits are. We can also test uh, functionally in function, functional genetic terms. We can use CRISPR to test the function of these genes. We can also test in a functional ecological framework what are the outcomes of these different phenotypes. So uh, for many, many years, folks have used racetracks to test the relationship between uh, form and function in lizards. And we're going to do the same with our CRISPR edited anoles, where we'll actually ask whether or not edited lizards have different limb dimensions and what's their capacity to run faster on different surfaces and substrates. A couple of quick um, conclusions as, as I wrap up here. Uh, we were able to generate really high quality in old genomes by compliant, combining platforms and, and, and really leaning hard on, on dovetail technology. We work in a broadly amenable system that's used for a whole lot of different research purposes, ecology, evolution, behavior, functional genetics development. And, and we have a unique opportunity. We have a, a rich set of phenotypic resources. We've just now developed this really wonderful set of genomic resources. And we've got CRISPR working in the group. And so I, I think there's an, it's an exciting time in an old evolutionary genetics. There's, there's a lot that we're now able to do. Um, and, and I'm really psyched to, to start answering some big questions using these data. Um, I'm not done assembling genomes either. I, I've kind of gotten in, into it uh, over these last few years. And so uh, in some cases, these are plans. In some cases, these are things that are funded. But uh, we're, we're going to do some dwarf chameleon genomes, uh, thinking about doing a wall lizard and, and trying to get funding now to do uh, one of the rarest boas in the world that we discovered a couple of years ago in the Bahamas. Um, with that, I want to thank uh, my many collaborators. This isn't everybody. These are the folks that, that uh, have, have done the most and the most recently. Uh, the paper for the sacred eye genome will have many more folks than just this. Also, uh, the team at Dovetail has been fantastic. Uh, Mark actually came and visited my animal room uh, in Cambridge uh, when, we, when we had one. So here's Mark holding an anole uh, 
but Sierra and, and Paul were huge help as, as we developed this project. And, and of course, thanks to the funding sources that made, that made this work possible. Thanks. All right. Um, so this first one, is the Brown Annulled 2.0 genome published yet? <laughs> it is not. <laughs> um, but we are working hard to get that done. Uh, Everyone has reasons uh, for things going slower than they want, and I, I, I'm, I'm among them. The, the hope is that uh, this fall we'll, we'll see, uh, uh, say, a brown and old genome uh, at least submitted. Okay, perfect. Um, the next question, did you verify chromosomal fissions and fusions with fish or another alternative technology? As yet, no, um, but it is something that we've been, we've been thinking about and are interested in. Um, there are folks who have, uh, so for instance, that slide that I showed, uh, those exact four uh, chromosomes have, have been hypothesized to be fused in sacri um, using fish. And uh, although my lab is unlikely to be doing uh, fish, I, I am open to collaboration to try to, yeah, experimentally verify some of these fusions and fissions. Wonderful. Um, the next question asks, what is the age of the root of the tree? And then parentheses, previous slide. So I'm not sure if you remember which slide this is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question, and it's one that we have a lot of trouble with. So um, my, my training is in phylogenetics, and uh, many groups have tried to get a, a solid estimate on the age of an old. Um, it's hampered by the fact that we don't have uh, a really useful uh, fossil record in the group. There are date estimates as old as 100 million years. More recent estimates are, are half of that or less, 35 to 50 million. Uh, you know. This is a guess and not something you should cite, but I would guess it's closer to the recent time. It's, it's you know, the 35 to 50 age versus 100 million year old age. Okay. Um, what does resequencing mean exactly? Sequencing at low coverage? Uh, yeah, okay. So um, it, it, to be absolutely certain, uh, I'm gonna say this is how I interpret uh, resequencing and I may not mm -hmm be correct about this, but what, when I say resequencing, what I mean is that we are sequencing uh, at moderate depth with the, the goal to align to a reference. We are not assembling uh, de novo, but aligning the sequence of reads that we generate to a reference sequence in order to genotype for example. Wonderful. Um, next question. Alfoldi et al. reported N50 of 79.9 KB. Did I hear you right when you said it was 150 MB? Is there a newer assembly or are you calculating it differently? Yeah, so uh, Alfoldi reported their contig N50. Their scaffold N50 is much higher. And that's, that's in the supplement of the Alfoldi et al. paper. It's 151 for the scaffold N50 and it's uh, 70, I, I, yeah, it's in the 70s for contig N50. Perfect. Um, do you do polishing for all assemblies? The reason I'm asking is that whether this can influence GLM you perform for completeness in Busco. Uh, no, so polishing's only been done on figure eyes. So eight of the nine are not yet polished. And that's why I didn't really go too in depth about those assemblies. Um, I, I, did, I did that analysis for this talk. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll obviously redo it again when all of the genomes are, are in their finalized states, but that's a, a very good point. Next question. Um, are Hox genes littered with transposons and all anolis? Have you sequenced different individuals to see if there are active transposons in the Hox locus? Uh, haven't done any of that work myself. Um, you're referring to the work of Natalie Feiner. Um, she's published a couple of papers recently uh, showing that the uh, uh, abundance of, of uh, repetitive elements within Hox clusters is broader than just a handful of species. I have not looked at the genome assemblies that we have yet to evaluate whether or not it's present in, in all of them. And I have not done anything to uh, evaluate whether or not they're active. Um, we got a couple more. Um, how do you estimate genome heterozygosity rate? Any specific tools or just a custom made script? Uh, so it's very, very rough. Um, but I'll tell you how we did it. It's actually, uh, so there is a um, uh, tool called Genome Scope. Um, Genome Scope takes the Kamer out output from a jellyfish run and uses the distribution of Kamers to estimate 
uh, genome size and genome heterozygosity. We're going to estimate heterozygosity the more traditional way by realigning our Illumina reads to our reference genomes and actually use uh, NIP callers, JTK or, or Freebase to estimate heterozygosity. But for the purposes of, of uh, today's talk, I just use the genome scope evidence uh, or estimates of heterozygosity. Next question, do you think this level of completeness can be achieved from museum samples? Any thoughts on ancient DNA work with high C kind of tech? Uh, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is that it'll be difficult. Um, these samples, every single one of them, uh, were, were flash frozen uh, at the time of, of, of being euthanized um, and were kept uh, in either liquid nitrogen or in a minus 80 uh, until the um, extraction work was done uh, at, at Dovetail for, for high C. Uh, there are folks at Rockefeller who are working on making a set of best practices for preserving samples for uh, high C or PAC bio-sequencing. Um, at least for the type of high C that we did, it required an intact euchromatic nuclei, and you're just not going to get that from museum material. You know, I, I'm a museum partisan myself, and I'd love to think that we could get really nice de novo assemblies from uh, museum material. What I do think there's a lot of value in, and, and a lot of potential for, is as getting resequenced genomes. Um, you know, the the preservation of of museum material results in fragmentation or cross-linking of uh, DNA in the sample, but uh, resequence data doesn't require long stretches of contiguous intact DNA. You can sequence in a shotgun manner of lots and lots of uh, at, at very high coverage and get yourself a resequence genome, but you'd have to align it to something relatively closely related to be able to call, uh, to be able to use that genome in, in a useful way. Long answer, sorry. No, no, that's great. Next question. Um, how did you handle phasing of the NGS versus the high C? Did you go for a collapsed or diploid sequence? And what were the pros and cons of those strategies for resequencing projects? Okay, uh, so uh, there's a bunch there. Um, haven't started the resequencing project yet, so we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll answer in kind of backwards order. Uh, we uh, haven't had a real good look at, at resequence data yet to get an idea of, of what we're dealing with. In, in the animals that we've looked at so far, you know, for our genomes, we had relatively high heterozygosity, and so phasing is going to be an issue that we have to work with. For the de novo assemblies, the initial de novo assemblies that were done, um, Miraculous was run in, in diploid mode, um, and that worked for the populations that we intentionally selected to have relatively low heterozygosity. Um, our first pass, which I didn't talk about here, was with the FIGRI from North America, and, and it just blew up on us. It was, had far too high heterozygosity to be able to be assembled, even at that early Illumina stage, effectively. Um, and rather than, than, you know, try to run down a fix for that, we opted to use an animal from a population that we knew from previous evidence was highly inbred, had extremely low heterozygosity. Um, so I, I'm sorry, uh, the person who asked the question, I, I don't have a really good answer yet for what we're going to do with our resequence data, and I don't have a great solution for dealing with heterozygosity, except for Waiting it for de novo assembly. Perfect. Um, the next question asks Could you be more specific on what depth of coverage is necessary for resequencing? We are planning to do between 30 and 60x. Um, there is pretty good evidence that at, at 30x coverage or greater, you're able to call uh, heterozygous, heterozygous sites in a, in a genome assembly. Um, that's not to say that you can't do interesting, useful evolutionary genetics with lower coverage sequencing. But if you're trying to get calls for most sites in the genome and you're trying to get uh, uh, identify sites that are heterozygous, then, then you need to be uh, over over 30 X coverage. Um, but there are perfectly valid reasons to do 5X coverage if what your question is uh, doesn't require you to have a genotype in every single site. All right. Well, I think that is all of the Q&A that we have submitted right now. So thank you all for your time, and I hope everyone has a wonderful week.